Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. It's a great honor to be here and to have the opportunity to speak to you and uh, give you a short overview over the development of civil law in Austria. I just have to take a look at the time because I think it's 20 minutes and I, I do my best to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, not to talk too long. So how, how does it work here? To, Okay. Oh, yes, fine. Okay, on that slide, you, uh, you see a survey of contents, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we'll start with the characteristic features of the Austrian Civil Code, and then I will provide or will give you a short overview of the historic development dealing with the 19th century, with the 20th century, and with the 21st century, and uh, when we come to an end, I will try a short glimpse into the future, if that it's possible. Okay, we start with the uh, for, we start with the characteristic features, and uh, many of the presentations we heard already uh, dealt with the uh, historic background of the Austrian Civil Code. So I do not have to go into detail anymore, uh, just to. Uh, repeat again that the Austrian Civil Code is part of the uh, first generation of civil codes you find in Europe after the, well, more or less first one, the Allgemeines Landrecht of the Prussian states, German codification in 1794, then the French Civil Code, Le Code Civil of uh, 1804, uh, perhaps you should also mention the uh, Code Civil de Louisiana, which dates back to 1807 or 1808, and then we have the Austrian Civil Code, Allgemeines Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch, ABGB, uh, from 1811, which is still in force today. And it was in force basically uh, in the Austrian countries, uh, it was, well, since I'm giving my presentation in, in Hungary, I tried to check again whether or not it was applicable in Hungary, and uh, it was applicable in Hungary only for a couple of years, and Professor Wekas told me yesterday that uh, 1852 is not quite correct, it should be 1853. Uh, just just one year of difference, but you see Hungarians obviously were not so happy with the Austrian Civil Code, so they applied it for just Eight, eight years, something like that. But in the Austrian countries, uh, what is now the Czech Republic, what is now the southern part of uh, Poland and uh, Slovenia and others, uh, the Austrian Civil Co Code was to be um, applied. And the interesting thing is that uh, there are various uh, translations of the Austrian Civil Code since the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was a multilingual uh, state. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, translations into Czech language, into Polish language, into even Italian language and, and, and others. So in a way the Austrian-Hungarian Empire perhaps was a little like the European Union in a nutshell, at least uh, from the uh, uh, language perspective. Okay, so let us take a look at some of the characteristic features of the uh, Austrian Civil Code. And the first character characteristic feature I would like to mention is uh, that it was inspired by natural law, especially by the legal philosophy or philosophy of Immanuel Kant. And uh, in the Civil Code you find some provisions where you can see that influence in a very immediate way. And one of the examples is Article 16 or Paragraph 16, uh, which says, I, I'm not quite sure whether the translation is very good, but uh, it would be something like every individual person, every individual has inherent rights already evident by common sense, in German it's Vernunft, and has thus to be considered as a person, which tells you that a uh, little personality of a human being is not provided by law, it exists by itself, just by the existence of the human being. And there are some other provisions in the civil code which are inspired by natural law in a very similar way. So uh, the next characteristic feature of the civil code in Austria is that it's a general civil code. A general civil code in a, uh, meaning that it applies to everybody in more or less the same way. 
From the modern perspective, that's quite clear. When you think back 200 years, it was not quite clear that in the Austrian Civil Code, there are no special rules or no special privileges for nobility and other social classes. So it applied in the same way uh, to everybody. Uh, you, you see Article 18, for instance, in, as an example, everybody is capable of acquiring rights subject to the conditions provided by the law. Third characteristic feature is the system of the civil code. And uh, the system of the civil code is in a way related, related to the, I, I'm not a Roman lawyer, uh, but it's uh, related to the institution system by uh, the Roman uh, jurist Gaius. Uh, which is based on, on, on persons and, and uh, patrimonial rights or property rights and, and action. And when you, when you take a look at the uh, system of the civil code, you have a very short introduction, which is just uh, 15 articles. Then we have the law of persons, which nowadays is more or less part of family law. Then you have property, and perhaps it should be better translated as patrimonial rights, because under, under the part what, what the civil code understands by property or patrimonial rights, it's property law in a narrower sense, it's succession law and the complete law of obligations. And then we have a third chapter dealing with common provisions for persons and property. So you have that kind of system. But there is one thing that's really amazing. Uh, the panictistic movement in the second half of the 19th century uh, was very influential in Austria as well, uh, in Germany, of course, but in Austria as well. And the result of that is that uh, in legal education at universities, law, civil law, is taught in a way based on the panictistic system. And all the textbooks for students are based on the panictistic system. So we teach law in a way which does not reflect the system of the civil code. That's quite amazing. Uh, <laughs> when I was still teaching at Vienna University, I had the idea that sometimes it might be very interesting to provide a textbook which reflects the system of the civil code. But unfortunately, there was no time for that. Uh, OK, uh, another characteristic feature on the next slide, which does not work now. OK, uh, next slide is principle versus rules. Um, the Austrian Civil Code is a relatively short codification in the original, uh, in the original text, the original version, there were um, uh, 1,502 articles. And that's pretty short if you compare it with other codifications. For instance, the Allgemeines Landrecht of the Prussian states, uh, I, I didn't count them, but literature, literature, literature tells me that it has around 19,000 articles. So in the Austrian Civil Code, you find less than 10 percent of the articles. And the reason for that is that the Austrian Civil Code is much less casuistical, much less detailed, and in a certain degree, you might say that the provision it has are more principle than rules. You might say that's exaggerated. OK, it might be exaggerated a little bit, but not very much. Uh, and what is interesting as well is that um, judges are encouraged to apply law by analogy. And you have the Article 7. Uh, and the Article 7 says, if a case can neither be determined by the wording nor by the natural meaning of a law, similar cases which have been regulated by law and other related laws have to be considered. So that's an obligation to apply analogy. Uh, and if the case still remains, uh, still, still remains ambiguous, it has to be decided based on the diligently gathered and thoroughly considered facts in line with the natural principles of law. The natural principles of law back then, 200 years ago, was natural law. Today, we consider that as the basic principle, the, the uppermost principles of, of, of private law. So, what you can see from that provision is that the authors of the civil code 
put some trust into the churches. They trusted uh, them by allowing them or even encouraging them to go beyond the written law. And I, I think that's a very fascinating idea, even when you think back 200 years. Okay, so, and my last characteristic feature is the question, do we have a dualistic or do we have a monistic system? Again, the Austrian civil code is a general civil code. It applies to everybody. If you take a closer look, you will find some provisions, but a very small number of provisions which are addressed especially to businesses. And one example is the Article um, uh, 1030, uh, which provides a presumption of power of attorney for an employee who is working in a shop. Uh, and, and that's addressed especially to businesses. Okay, but there's a very small number of, of provisions. Uh, Yes, and one should also say that in the civil code there is a chapter on partnerships, which is based on the Roman law societas, but at the time when the civil code was adopted more than 200 years ago, these provisions on partnership uh, were the only provisions for companies we had. So all the companies that existed, even John Stock companies, were based on that chapter on, on partnerships. Okay, however, right from the beginning, in the first half of the 19th century, there was the idea that the civil code should be completed by a commercial code. And there was even a working group in around 815, 820. Uh, there was a working group for a special commercial code, but this uh, idea failed, the efforts to, to um, provide, to, to prepare a commercial code uh, failed. So actually it took until um, 1862 uh, that Austria adopted the German general commercial code which remained into force until 1938. And in 1938 under the Nazi regime the German commercial code from 19 uh, from 1900 uh, was adopted, and after some amendments, it's still, uh, it's still in force today, uh, which means that the Austrian uh, system is based on a dualistic system. So we have the civil code and we have a commercial code, and of course, lots of different laws for special types of companies, joint stock company, company with limited liability, and so on. Okay, so these are the characteristic features and now I should go back again. Okay, yes. Uh, and we'll continue with, sorry, sorry for that. We'll continue with the 19th century. Development in the 19th century, I think it's very short. Uh, 19th century was the era of Biedermeier, the era of peace and tranquility, at least in the field of legislation, and not much happened, practically nothing happened. There were almost no changes to the civil code, and uh, the Austrians were happy, and the Austrians thought they had the best codification in the world. Again, you might say I'm exaggerating it a little bit, but I do, but I'm not very much, so everybody was satisfied. And the amazing thing is that the Industrial Revolution did not affect the civil code. When you go back 200 years, when the civil code was adopted, it was the time before uh, industry, it was the time even before railroads, it was the time of horse-drawn carriages, it was a completely different economic uh, system, different economic environment, and it's really amazing that the Industrial Revolution did not really affect the civil code. And the lack of legislation does not reflect the enormous development in the field of academic research, and uh, again, I'm referring to the Pentecostal movement. So that's basically the 19th century. That's very easy. Now we continue with the 20th century. And in the 20th century, right from the beginning, things changed. And one of the major reasons for that was that in, on, at the 1st January of 1900, it was mentioned before, uh, yesterday already, uh, the German civil code uh, came into force. And 
That gave the Austrians the idea that perhaps the Austrian civil code was not as modern and as contemporary anymore as they had believed. And legislation, there was a huge discussion which started then, and legislation came to the conclusion that the civil code needed some kind of a facelift. And the facelift uh, was prepared between it was also mentioned yesterday already, between 1914 and 1916, there was three larger amendments, the so-called Teil Novelle, it was mentioned yesterday, uh, and they wanted to facelift the, or to revamp, you might say, uh, the Austrian uh, civil code. Uh, these uh, amendments, these Teil Novellen, are partially influenced by the German uh, civil code. Uh, some provisions were taken even, were copied almost literally from the German civil code and transferred into, into the Austrian one. And what is amazing is that uh, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, during the time of the First World War, at the brink of collapse already, still had the power to, for these major amendments. Okay, so after the uh, breakdown, after the collapse of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, um, then came the Nazis and the civil code survived the Nazi regime. And the reason for that was not uh, that the Nazis were so enthusiastic about the Austrian civil code. The idea was that the Nazi had the idea to replace both the German civil code and the Austrian civil code by a new civil code, which of course should be inspired by Nazi ideology. But uh, this idea <laughs> failed because the Nazi regime broke down before that idea could be, um, <clears throat> could be finalized. Okay. So we're still in the 20th century, and if we take a look at the development in the 20th century as a whole, we can say the civil code loses power. The idea of the codification, at least in Austria, has eroded, become weaker during the entire 20th century. And you can see that from the very simple fact that today, many parts of private law, and especially those which mostly affect people's everyday life are regulated outside the civil code in special laws. And this is especially true for labor law. You find some general provisions on a labor contract in the civil code, but most of it is regulated in special laws outside the civil code. It's especially true for housing law, for instance, lease of apartments, condominiums, and so on. It's true for consumer law, which of course is uh, inspired very much by the EU um, uh, law. It's especially true for consumer law. Uh, about 40 years ago, there was the first Consumer Protection Act, but nowadays, uh, consumer protection law is, um, you, you, you can find that in at least a dozen, sp a special, uh, a dozen special laws, consumer law, strict liability, railways, cars, and so on. And perhaps I should add a fifth uh, branch of law uh, which uh, also is in, in great parts regulated outside the civil, uh, civil code, that's family law. Okay, so the idea of the codification loses power. Um, so now we're turning to the 20th, uh, to the 21st century, uh, and I will start with the question, where do we stand today? And my, evalu uh, my assessment, uh, I'm sure some of my other Austrian colleagues would come to a different conclusion, but my assessment is that the Austrian civil code is just a torso. Uh, it's still a general code in the sense that it applies to everyone, but it's no more a general code which would provide solution for the, most of the legal conflicts one might expect. So I, th I think it's just, just a torso. And that leads to the next question, and that is, do we have a mood for reform in Austria? And my very simple answer is no. 
And I would like to uh, show that uh, by, by two examples. And the first example, okay, I will, I will come to an end within a couple of minutes. Uh, the first example is the reform of tort law. Uh, most of the provisions uh, uh, dealing with tort law, which you find in the civil code, date back to 1811, uh, so they are more than 200 years old. And uh, courts have produced a wide range of case material. They have produced tons of, of, of case law in the field of tort law, uh, which is not reflected by the provision in the civil code. So if you just read the provision in the civil code, you would not have an idea what courts produced from these provisions. So there, actually, there is really case law in, in that field of law. So in 2001, in 2001, the Austrian Ministry of Justice had the idea, let us recodify tort law. Let us make a new tort law. That's a, that's a good idea. And what happened then was that there were two competing working groups. The members of the first working group were appointed by the Ministry of Justice. The members of the second working group more or less appointed themselves. Most of them were academics who had not been appointed in the first working group. So there were two competing working groups and both of them uh, prepared a draft for a new tort law. And these drafts were completely contradictory, which had two reasons. The first reason is it was a methodological one. The first working group was the, I should not be too ironic about it, uh, first working group were the members of which were very much fond of Walter Wilbur's flexible system. So the entire draft was based on Walter Wilbur's flexible system and the members of the other working group strictly opposed uh, the flexible system. So that was the methodological reason. Uh, the second reason perhaps was even a personal one because some of the members of the both, both working groups were even hostile to each other. I was not a member of either of the working groups, so I can have a neutral position. Uh, okay, so we had two different working groups, two different drafts, and this was the reason why the Ministry of Justice lost interest and the uh, reform process failed, came to an end, so we still have the tort law of 1811. Nothing changed. Okay, then we had the year 2011. And 2011 was a symbol, 2000, uh, 200 years of the civil code. And again, a process of discussion started. How should we get along with that old codification? Uh, the Ministry of Justice started a project, ABGB 200 plus. And ABGB 200 plus means that the idea was a step-by-step -step reform of the civil code. And only two of these steps has been realized. One step was the reform of the, cre of, of, of the co credit contract, but uh, which was nothing more, well, a little more, but not very much more than what was, uh, had to be done because of the transposition of the uh, consumer credit uh, directive uh, by, by the EU law. And then, uh, 2015, we had a huge reform of succession law. The entire succession law was made anew. Uh, 300, almost 300 articles, so the entire succession law was uh, amended. And that looks like a huge reform. But when you take a closer look, you will find that it's more or less the old uh, succession law, which just got a new paint. It was repainted. Uh, and what do I mean with repainted? What legislation did was they took the old provisional succession law, which, uh, um, um, which uh, s s some of the provisions uh, were difficult to understand because they use a language 
of 200 years ago. And what Austrian legislation did was they translated the old provision into a modern contemporary language. So 85% of these provisions which were amended were just translated into a modern language. So that's just a new paint of succession law. Of course, there were some substantial changes, especially in the field of compulsory shares, but most of it is just a repaint of the old succession law. Okay, I'm coming to the end now. And what is the future ahead? Uh, let me just repeat what I said before. I think there is no mood for codification in Austria. Uh, and I wonder why uh, it is that way. And, and my idea is, and I, I, I talk to, to politicians about that, I think the idea of codification is nothing which wins you an election. And I think that's a very, very simple reason for the lack of mood of codification. So the amendments to civil, to civil law we have are, first, induced by transformation of EU directives. Secondly, initiated by stakeholders, is, for instance, consumer organization, which leads to casuistic provisions, and in, uh, in, in rare cases, replacement for provisions which are repealed by the Constitutional Court or are overruled by the European Courts of Justice. So these are the main sources of amendment, and that not, has nothing to do with codification. And there are no plans for a major reform of the civil code in the near future. Uh, what has started as ABGB 200 plus uh, 10 years ago, um, 12 years ago, no one talks about it anymore, so that idea has come to an end. And so my final question is, will this Austrian civil code, the ABGB, or what will be left from it then, reach its 250th anniversary in 2016? Well, I'm not a fortune teller, but if I had to put a bet on it, my answer would be yes. Thank you very much.